Dorothea, I know if we dig, we're going to find more. I know that. Well, I didn't put them there. I couldn't drag a body any place. I have never killed anybody. Seems believable enough. The woman in this interrogation looks as though she could be your grandmother. Just a little old lady with white hair and big glasses, however, looks can be deceiving. In reality, this granny is a cold, callous killer. She puts on a loving persona to lure desperate, struggling people right into her clutches. Dorothea Puente is one of California's most notorious female serial killers, and there is a curious reason why her backyard is littered with bodies. This is the twisted story of the Death House Landlady. January 9th, 1929. Dorothea Gray grows up in Redlands, California in an unstable household with abusive alcoholic parents. Her dad, in front of the kids, regularly threatens to take his life, but loses it to tuberculosis when Dorothea is just eight years old. He leaves his wife Trudy behind with the seven kids, and she feels incapable of raising all these children. Unfortunately, Trudy dies just a year later in a motorcycle crash, a few days before Christmas. Dorothea and her siblings are then placed in an orphanage, where she routinely experiences unwanted sexual advances and is regularly taken advantage of. In 1945, at the age of 16, she starts working in the sex industry to make some money and just survive. There, she meets a soldier named Fred McFall, who's just returned back home from World War II. Now, Fred is six years older than Dorothea, and they get married and eventually have two daughters together. They won't raise their children, though, because the first is sent off to live with family members, and the other is placed up for adoption. Shortly after, in 1948, Dorothea receives her first criminal offense, serving four months in jail after being caught writing out fake checks. After Dorothea gets out of jail, she moves from Riverside, a city about an hour south of Los Angeles, up north to Sacramento. Over the next two decades, she goes through several marriages and is routinely arrested for running a number of schemes. She often finds herself in and out of prison for forging documents and stealing from others, all to finance a lavish lifestyle. Further, the cunning woman has adopted various different identities as a way to keep escaping her dark past. She's sent back to jail in 1960, serving three months time for running a brothel disguised as a bookkeeping business. A year later, after endless lying, cheating, alcoholism, and several failed suicide attempts, her third husband decides to commit her to a mental institution. There, doctors diagnose her as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. Years later, court officials will make a similar evaluation by adding the words evil and murderer as well. Five years after she's sent to the psych ward, Dorothea again changes her identity to a caring Christian woman. She fully embodies this persona by becoming a caretaker to people who are elderly, homeless, or suffer from mental or physical disabilities. However, this allegedly religious woman is by no means a saint because she is using them to put together a diabolical plan. Dorothea moves into a three-story Victorian boarding house in Sacramento. It's located at 1426th Street, and the charming home is just a few miles away from the state capitol. There's enough space to rent it out for 16 people, and as soon as the occupants start moving in, Dorothea is stealing from them in a clever way. She's hauling in over $5,000 a month, but is eventually busted for forging as many as 34 of her tenants' government checks. Essentially, she's in charge of the mail, so when people are supposed to get their disability or social security checks, she collects them and takes the majority of the money for herself. She tells the tenants that it's for rent and other expenses before paying them out what's left over. She's given a slap on the wrist for the crimes, only having to pay a small fine and receiving five years of probation. However, her plan becomes far more sinister three years later. In 1982, one tenant named Ruth Monroe dies just two weeks after moving in. Dorothea tells investigators that the woman was depressed over her husband's terminal illness and had therefore taken her life. And when the coroner finds several drugs in Ruth's system, her death is labeled a suicide. This label will later change though, because Ruth isn't the only person to have checked into Dorothea's boarding house, 
and never checked out. But more on that in a moment. Detectives are called back to the home a month later when another tenant accuses her of stealing from him and drugging him. Dorothea is convicted of three counts of theft and is sentenced to prison for five years. However, she's released after serving just three of these on the condition that she never again works with the elderly or handles their checks. Parole officers will visit the death house on 15 separate occasions and never cite any violations. So many lives that could have been saved if they had just done their jobs. As soon as Dorothea is freed, the shapeshifter again radically changes her appearance. Previously, she'd used the stolen money to get expensive clothes, manicures, and even a facelift. But now she's taking a different approach. Her hair is as white as snow. She wears these thick glasses, purchases dentures, and dresses, well, like this. Her elderly appearance makes her seem far more approachable, and now she is back in business. The house at 1426th Street is again up and running, and targeting the most vulnerable members of society. Business is better than ever, with Dorothea being a favorite among social workers because she willingly takes in their tough-to-place clients. Soon, dozens of referrals are coming her way, and as each new resident walks through the door, all she can see is dollar signs. The majority of them will never be seen again. That is, until their bodies are dug up, x-rayed, and fingerprinted. In November 1988, a social worker becomes concerned after not hearing from her client in weeks. She files a missing persons report for a man named Albert Montoya. He suffers from schizophrenia and his last marked location is 1426th Street. Curiously though, this isn't the first time that authorities are told that someone's gone missing from that same property. See, a year earlier, they'd received a tip that bodies were being buried in the backyard, but they dismissed it because the person who made the report is a drug addict. Imagine how investigators, or worse, the victim's families felt after hearing this detail. Information that could have stopped Dorothea's scheme much sooner. When Sacramento police arrive at the property, three detectives knock at the door and it's answered by an older looking woman. To them, she almost looks like a character out of that old TV show, The Golden Girls. She's wearing a little vintage dress, pink plastic glasses, and appears totally harmless. But this 56 year old is putting on an act, because in reality, she is a cunning killer whose lies are about to be unearthed. After noticing some fresh dirt on the property, detectives ask if they can dig around. Dorothea tells them, no problem, I've got nothing to hide, even lending them a shovel. The men start digging until one of them exposes what appears to be pieces of cloth and beef jerky. Thinking it's a tree root, the detectives keep whacking at it with a shovel to loosen it up, but when the man wraps his hand around the object to pull it out, it's a human femur. Dorothea stands inside the house, watching from the window above, and she doesn't flinch or show any emotion as the detectives slowly back away from what is now a crime scene. Okay, now you'd think Dorothea would at least be taken into custody after detectives found a literal corpse in her backyard, but no. Once again, she uses her charm and is released to go back to the house on 1426th Street, the same home where the next day forensic investigators will be digging in her backyard. The next morning, they find another body, followed by another and another, and as cadavers keep cropping up, Dorothea, who is also at the house, is scheming a plan. She asks an officer if she can get a cup of coffee at a nearby hotel just around the block. He then personally escorts her around the corner, not to keep an eye on her, but to protect her from all the media and eavesdroppers. At this point, they're all gathered around the death house hoping to get a glimpse of the human remains as they're removed from the property. Seven bodies are slowly scooped out of their makeshift graves, and all of them are at different stages of decomposition. This explains the horrible smell that neighbors had been complaining about for so long. One of the bodies is missing its head, hands, and feet, but eventually each of the corpses are identified. 
And the missing man who triggered the search, Bert Montoya, is the third body found on the premises. Now, due to the decay, it's hard for the medical examiner to determine the cause of death. Toxicology reports reveal that all the bodies have a drug in their system called Dalmain, which is known for its sedative properties. It's typically only used for sleep, and by no coincidence, none of the residents have a prescription. But can you guess who does? Authorities speculate that Dorothea had drugged her tenants before suffocating them with a pillow and burying them in the backyard. See, it's important to know that poisons are commonly used among female serial killers. They don't require a lot of strength, so there's no need to physically overpower the victim, especially if you're a little old lady. And further, they realized that all of the tenants had one important thing in common. All had been receiving welfare checks from the government due to their age or disability. So authorities know why and how she did it, but they don't know where she is. And you're probably thinking, Jack, she was literally just at the house with the officer, right? Remember Dorothea's little coffee run earlier? Well, this turns into a five-day manhunt because Granny's so good at charming people that she used the fake story to make an escape. She's so good that the FBI ends up getting involved, and they, along with the Sacramento Police Department, are searching for the missing woman. They scour bus stops, airports, railway stations until a tip finally comes in saying that Dorothea is at a bar in downtown LA. A guy there had recognized her from the news reports and called the cops saying that she's in the area. When federal agents and the LAPD show up to room 34 at the Royal Viking Motel, Dorothea is finally taken into custody. She's then flown back to Sacramento in a Learjet, where she'll be accused of half a dozen murders. I used to be a very good person at one time. Well, that must have been a long time ago because the drug test from the coroner changes the death of Ruth Monroe from suicide to homicide. Her name is added to the list of Dorothea's potential victims, and so is her ex-boyfriend. His body had been found in a makeshift coffin, tossed alongside a riverbed, and up until this point, had remained unidentified for three years. The case is taken to trial in March 1993, and Dorothea Puente is accused on nine counts of murder. And the prosecutors make the case fairly simple. This sweet old lady is really a heartless killer who poisoned people for profit. Looks aren't what they seem. They tell the jury, and Dorothea is the devil in disguise. The defense argues there's no proof that she had committed the murders, and if she had, her tough upbringing means that her life is worth saving. After five months of deliberation, Dorothea is convicted on three counts of murder, but the jury is split down the middle on the other six. Eventually, the judge declares these deaths as a mistrial, meaning she won't be charged or labeled guilty or not guilty. Still though, Dorothea is given two life sentences, and while in prison, publishes a cookbook. It's called Cooking with a Serial Killer, and the publisher writes in the opening, Dorothea's been accused of a lot of things, but being a bad cook isn't one of them. It features various recipes such as how to make prison tamales. Y'all, this is honestly messed up, and I don't know how this kind of stuff is allowed, but I read the reviews online, and it seems like people are saying the food is pretty damn good. Further, Dorothea's death house at 1426th Street isn't torn down because it's considered a historical monument. The home has new owners who embrace its dark history, giving tours of the property in an effort to raise money for the very types of organizations that Dorothea took advantage of. Now, there are a few unanswered questions around the case, and the second one you guys are probably already thinking. So while Dorothea is accused of nine murders, there are multiple people who claim that their loved ones went missing while in her care. And to this day, these people still haven't been found, making her kill count as high as 25. The other big mystery is that Dorothea wasn't exactly a large person, but some of these tenants were big. There's absolutely no way she could have moved the bodies from the house to the backyard all by herself. Someone must have been involved or helped in some way. Did she get assistance from some of the other guests, or were there people she knew from her time in prison that were doing all of the dirty work? I really want to know if there are logs of any tenants showing who had lived in the house for the longest time without having any negative reports of Dorothea. 
More likely though, I think it's probably a person or people she knew from prison because ex-convicts aren't going to speak up and risk going back to jail. The mystery remains, and over the years, no one has come forward, and the case is now closed. On March 27, 2011, Dorothea Puente dies of natural causes at 82 years old. She claims her innocence up until death, and her secrets are taken with her to the grave.